Eh, non vedo l'immagine però. Eccola, ecco, ci siamo. Good. So, hi everybody. Welcome to or welcome back to the Fragilità Exhibition and Events. Today is the opening of A Student's Diary, a series of live events within the Fragilità Project hosted by Kulturit. As you may know, Fragilità is an ongoing exhibition launched by Particle with the gracious support of the Italian Embassy in Kuala Lumpur. Over the next few weeks, we will be exploring the theme of fragility under a different perspective, and today we start this journey together. Uh, let me just briefly introduce what um, Culturit is. Uh, Culturit is a network of uh, university students, professors and professionals present in 12 Italian cities. Um, it works on actual, innovative and high social impact projects aimed at enhancing Italian culture and strategic industries for the Italian economy. Uh, we do so by leveraging on our network, creating new connections and opportunities among students, professors and professionals. Uh, and this is uh, actually what connects us to Particle, this desire to bridge communities and close gaps. We do it through consulting projects, training and development of skills. They do it through art, offering immersive and interactive experiences. Uh, I will be moderating this event with Marta, uh, but first of all, I would like to thank Caterina Farnia, a visual illustrator who will join us today and help us uh, visualize our thoughts through sketches and illustrations. Uh, we also invite you to jump right into the conversation uh, through Slido. I will be sharing a QR code so you can um, have access to this chat. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the UniKL students who are joining this conversation today. And um, that's it. I invite you to, to scan the QR code. This is, sorry to interrupt, but this is all very interesting, Marietta, but I promise. But we're actually, what are we actually here for today? Like, can you tell us? I mean, you could tell us, Marta. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, fine. So today's topic is actually fragility of beauty. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce you Maria Rapicavoli and thank her for being here today. Um, as you might have seen, she's actually one of the eight artists included in the exhibition. Um, and her work is exactly what inspired us for our talk today. Um, Benedetta, I don't know if you maybe would like to share the image we chose for Fragility of Beauty. Um, and the picture you will now see is actually um, the picture which uh, made us think of Fragility of Beauty um, firstly, and it is actually the first picture that uh, is part of the collection of images that Maria Rapicavoli um, took in uh, Reminder. Uh, I honestly don't think, um, don't know how many of us would have taken a picture of something so broken, so fragile, so fractured cap and captured it, um, like these broken pieces of glass. Um, and honestly, I don't know how many of us would have actually seen beauty in something so fragile. So, but Maria fortunately did, and this is why we're here today. So maybe uh, Maria, tell us the story behind this picture. Yeah, hi. Hi everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, the story is um, actually it happened, it started like uh, exactly a year ago, almost a year ago, because this was, uh, this picture was taken during the first week of lockdown. And we, we went into lockdown, uh, I think on March 18 in, in New York City. I'm, I don't remember, but anyway, really almost a year ago. And um, that was, um, uh, I was walking, it was early morning. I was very scared and I, we didn't have a really lockdown like in Italy, we, we, could, we, we could go outside um, if we wanted. And I was just having sometimes some short walks in the very beginning, and that was like on my street. Uh, and I saw this, uh, this accumulation of glass and uh, I, I somehow got like um, attracted. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I need, it. I need to photograph this. So the more I was photographing it, the more I was thinking that I wanted to take it home and eventually make a sculpture or something with that because I really like it. And that was, uh, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what happened. It was clearly a broken uh, glass uh, and it was something that clearly happened like the night before. It was, they haven't cleaned the street yet. So I asked uh, someone and they told me that there was a building that was uh, vandalized the night before. 
and nobody knows why it was like and that building was an abandoned building um and so i decided to uh collect all of this glass and take it home and uh i did it quickly uh i i just took it home and then as soon as i took this all of this glass home which was a lot actually <laughs> like three bags four bags actually of uh, and ikea bags um i i as soon as i took them home i had some kind of fear i don't know why it was really rational fear literally now a year later i can say that i probably was scared of the reality of what was happening outside and i couldn't really um manage it so i i took it outside again and i got rid of it right after um I, it was at home with me but still i was thinking about this uh all of this glass which had different colors because i think uh it was the the glass this window was first uh, sprayed with colors and then they this they they broke it so that's why some parts of the of the glass is like uh, light blue or green or black and uh, and the rest is like the color of the of the glass and so i i actually uh after i got rid of it i i really i was thinking of it and i start start writing uh kind of a diary i mean i started my project with uh, uh from 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 this uh, this moment on and i started writing down everything all my feelings and all the everything i was experiencing during during the lockdown um including the fact that then i wanted to i decided to um remodel a lot of pieces of clay and remake this uh glass um so actually that's what i did for about a month more than a month in my apartment <laughs> and that's the result of of like the like the end of the, the project then there is a sculpture yeah that um kind of um represent that thank you thank you very much <laughs> Um, well, we know you're very busy, so you're free to stay <laughs> in this conversation if you have time, you. but we don't want to take any more of your time, so feel free to um, leave. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah, now with Benedetta, I would like to just ask you, the audience, um, would you have actually thought of taking a picture of something so broken, so fragmented, like these broken pieces of glass? Because honestly, I don't know if I would have. I don't know. Benedetta, would you? I, like, I mean... I, I don't know for that case specifically, but you know, sometimes it happens that you picture something which is not properly beautiful or like that there is this uh, also tendency to picture uh, abandoned building and like uh, stuff, random stuff on the street, right? I, I've seen many recently, especially uh, of this kind of photography that like kind of captures um, moments of, um moments of of reality because in the end fragility is, is reality in a way right yeah i mean it's we're recently especially this year we've experienced firsthand um fragility in our everyday lives and and how it's literally everywhere it's it's our reality so i absolutely agree and i feel like there are so many um things that are actually fragile but at the same time so beautiful um, in their essence. Um, I don't know if I think of like um, old pictures, old photographs, you right. know, which hold yeah. such an important meaning, um, emotional meaning to them, you know? Oh, for sure. Like, I don't know about the other students, but I mean, I always keep broken books, broken photography from like memory. That's, that's the beauty of it, right? Yeah, exactly. I feel like their beauty lies exactly in the fact that they are so fragile and so old. Um, and therefore so precious, you know? Um, yeah, I feel like also, if you think of like frescoes, um, those are, an, I feel like a good example to show how there's something so ruined over time, so fragmented, um, but that's exactly what makes them so nice, so pretty. Absolutely, absolutely. They're, they're valuable because they're old, you know? So mm -hmm. you actually, in their fragility and in the way they they just got ruined that's very interesting i mean in from from what we thought of beauty for instance mm -hmm. and even the whole like restoration that lies behind them all the historical yeah. uh, 
things that were made to them are exactly what makes them so you know important and what makes them as such um, yeah. i think that's very interesting thinking, thinking of objects i can also think of broken shells for instance you know yeah. on the beach yeah. you just select them i mean yeah. and they're so beautiful because you you can actually i mean see inside them and and discover like uh what they're made of and you can just collect many i have so many broken shells actually at home yeah that's really true um it's something that we've all done i feel like from when we were like little kids you know just go to the beach and get some broken seashells and we just thought they were the best thing i personally agree with you i was very much obsessed with them and i i collected them i brought them home i'd show my family yeah, yeah. and you them that's what's interesting so mm -hmm. just like maria did you know maria pictured this um like broken glass to keep it in a way with her you know and that's mm -hmm. the, exact, the exact same thing you do with a memory or 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 a broken object that carries a sort of memory uh mm -hmm. and, and which is beautiful to you and as because i i really i really agree with what you said at the beginning that sometimes uh, it's not obvious that everyone would picture or or keep or or feel the beauty of the same things, especially if it's broken things. So um, that's super uh, subjective, but also I feel that when something is broken, that means that something is special, unique in a way. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely different from anything else, which is perfect, which of course is pretty, it's beautiful because it's perfect, but it's not unique in its own way. It's not the thing, the fact that it's broken is what makes it special, what makes it unique. Um, and I feel like there's also like a Japanese tradition of um, like repairing things, repa repairing broken things. I don't know if you know about it. Of if course, I'm yeah, yeah. You mean the golden, um, it's like a golden glue. You know, yeah. you, you guys know it. Do you have something similar in Malaysia? I, I think uh, we, I think I've seen it before. I think a picture of, uh, of probably of a vase or that, mm -hmm. you know, it happens to be broken and then it was collected together and pieces together by the, mat by the goal, you know. I think the, the story that lies behind it, you know, that the story that it brings after it has been restored using gold to make sure that it fully uses its um, potential again. I think it's very interesting. You know, yeah. um, again, when we talk about the, in the particles, you know, when we talk about the fragile fragility of um, materials um, in Malaysia. In Malaysia itself, you know, we have a lot of you know old buildings, um, ancient mm -hmm. buildings. You know. I remember going around when I was a kid, you know, going through this building, you know, we have around around the building, you know, shards, um, shards or debris of the building. You know, I remember touching them, feeling them, the tactile feeling from it, you know, you know, you know that there are a lot of stories that goes behind the shards of buildings, you know, that this is actually a big, big, uh, a big story that lies behind it. And it's very intriguing as a kid. I I do like the mystery that lies behind of it. You know, you know what actually happens that causes the building to be like this. You know that this building must have gone through numerous amount of um, problems that causes it to be you know probably probably a bit slanted from the current situation, from a bit destroyed from the previous uh, um, exact uh, look of it. You know that's. That is what actually makes it even more beautiful. That the story, that the mystery that lies behind it, it's yeah. very, very um, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you completely. Like what you what you said about like when you see a building that is broken or like ruined, you immediately think like, what 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 was it? What what made it like that? Right. So. You, you you really feel the history that's behind and also it, it that's exactly what maria told us about so she saw that and she tried to recognize why it's painted why it's broken what happened it yes it wasn't there today it's there so there is this mystery i i completely agree with you 
Yeah, it's interesting to see the whole story behind it because you realize it's not just a, a piece of glass, but there's a whole story behind that piece of glass and what made it be there? What, why is it there? What, when, when did it happen? There's so many questions that emerge from it. And that's the beauty of it in the end. It's not beautiful because it's beautiful like, I don't know, a landscape or a sunset or something that, I mean, it's more objectively beautiful, but it's beautiful for what it carries, you know, in its, in its wounds and in, in its uh, fragilities. That, that's exactly the topic of today. Yeah, that's very true. Um, so I, I just um, steal the sharing of the screen a second from Katerina to, to remind our audience that they can absolutely contribute uh, and suggest her what to draw. <laughs> so just let me share briefly the QR code so you will be able. Here it is, you should be able to see it, right? So you can scan this code and jump into the discussion in our questions. Yeah, we'd love to hear about personal experiences or like personal memories or, you know, things that you saw that you thought were fragile and you wondered yourself, what happened behind this picture? What happened behind this piece of glass behind this? Yeah. Broken and, thing? and going back to, to that idea of uniqueness, um, I don't know if Katerina is ready, but we actually have a little game to show you. <laughs> I'll, I'll just quit sharing the screen now so we can do that. Because actually, when we like decided what to, what to talk about today, we really wanted to, to speak by examples and, and by images, in a way. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Katerina. Yeah, I don't know if anybody recognizes this, but um, it is a famous uh, piece. A <laughs> sculpture. This one also very big important piece. Um, and I feel like if we see them like this, they might seem like um, you know pretty much any sculpture uh, we can imagine. Um, they don't say something. Maybe we don't. I don't know. Immediately recognize them. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe just let let us know, guys. Is this too European in a way? Because I'm I'm. Sure uh, Europeans will recognize that because it's we, we studied that on history books like hundred times, right, Marta? It's like oh, yeah. we see it and yeah. see it again. Mm -hmm. Maybe a hint from Katerina. Can you get a hint? <laughs> Maybe now something starts to seem more familiar. Yeah, it, it is definitely familiar to me now. I, I can I can give a hint. I hope not to not to be wrong, but it should be um a Louvre in Paris. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Maybe, Martha, you want to tell us the solution of this first one, right? <laughs> yes. Well, the one on the right is actually the winged victory or um, of Samothrace. So I don't know if any of you know it, but I'm pretty sure most of you do. Um, yeah, I mean, the name, thank you, Martha, for this great pronunciation. I wouldn't be able to do the same, but I mean, the name probably can, can I mean, might not be that familiar, but the shape and these wings, uh, they're so recognizable, especially, as I said, uh, when, when seeing uh, museums in Europe, that's very uh, a symbol of it. And, and it's broken, right? So that, that's exactly the point in the end. Yeah, and I feel like the fact that it's broken is what makes it obviously known to us. Um, and before, before Katerina started erasing parts of it, as I said before, it could have been really much, pretty much any sculpture. It could have, you know, it wouldn't, it didn't catch your eye as, as now that we know what it is and we know the name of it. Exactly. And it's, it's, a similar, it's, it's a similar story for the other one, right? Mm -hmm. So again, that's like just a Greek statue or like whatever, I mean, 
it's very common to see similar statues uh, around museums, etc. But then when when we take out the arms, <laughs> it gets the I mean it gets it becomes the Venus, Venus, Venere, Venus of Vila. Yes. So another very famous statue that we can see. These are just two examples to show how something broken can also be that beautiful and become, you know, one of the biggest pieces in, in history. Exactly. And thanks to Katharina again for, for visualizing this. It would have been difficult, you know, like, uh, you know, the Nike of Samutrasha and people be like, no, <laughs> no clue. Yeah. But actually, okay, let, let's move this ahead. So. I love these examples. It was so good. Also, the building one, I really like that. But in, in the end, what makes fragility beautiful? So we said the memories. I mean, I said the memories. You might have a different opinion. But uh, is it the memory or is it for like some kind of like real beauty? Because if I think of something fragile, which I also think is beautiful, I immediately think of a soap bubble for instance. Mm -hmm. So if you picture a soap bubble, that's like a perfect circle that just flows in the wind. Uh, but then it, you, just, you, you just by touching it, that just pops. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, do I think it's beautiful because of its like shape and, and thinness and perfection? Or is it because it's fragile? What would you say? Hmm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because I feel like there's a little bit of both. Um, it's kind of an open question, you know. I feel like for some aspects it lays in its perfection because obviously a soap bubble, like you said, or um, I don't know if I have to think of a butterfly, they're beautiful precisely because they're perfect. The shapes, the colors of them, um, the the you know all their what makes them such as such uh, makes them beautiful. But at the same time, the fact that they are so precarious, so fragile also um you know gets our attention catches our attention and tells us okay so that's what makes them beautiful um yeah it's weird yeah. because as children we would just you know pop bubbles um and that was what made us happy what you know the nice part about bubbles uh so i guess their beauty lied laid in their in their precariousness and the fact that they were fragile and that we could just you know break them um, but at the time we were like amazed by how perfect they were and we would just look at them before popping them. So I feel like a little bit of both. What do you guys think? Can you, can you think of any other example of something that is like perfect in a way, but fragile at the same time? Um, I mean, like, you know. <laughs> Coming from Malaysia, then you, the climate is not very cold, you know, and you don't have snow here. So I've been to a country that has snow, so the snow season. So I remember being, uh, being very fascinated over these snow particles, you know, the, how, you know, it, it touches your, your hand, your gloves, and you see it, you like, at far, you can only see it as a small particle, like a round particle. But when you see it closely, you can definitely see the shape of it, you know, how mm. intricate the shape of it, you know, and plus how fragile it is. It's very fascinating knowing the fact that how small that particle can have this very intricate design. That's mm. definitely something that is um, mind boggling and intriguing as, uh, as I, what I can say. Um, yeah, I mean, like you can definitely see the beauty of it, you know. Um, that every pieces of the ice snow particle that it's not the same that is it has its own shapes that causes it to be like that way you know that uh, how many sharp things that it has you know how many stems that it has the yeah. octagon or the hexagon shape of it <laughs> it's something that is very <laughs> intriguing and beautiful that it only happens for a certain season, that it only happens for a situation that requires it to be, you know, and it's yeah. very, very unique and beautiful. That's very, that's very on point. Like, that's exactly what we were 
wondering. Also, Katharina is giving a, a suggestion as well, in a way. I don't know if that comes from the public or uh, butterflies. Do, do you know that butterflies, by, just by touching them, they, they won't fly anymore. If you, if you touch their wing, they will just stop flying, at least. I mean, that's what I've been told since I'm very little. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was thinking also of like a spider web. It's so like perfectly geometric and like all the lines perfectly, you know, symmetric and geometrical. Um, that also is very fragile. I mean, if you just, you know, touch a spider web, if you see it in a corner and you're like, oh, there's a spider web, I need to clean. And then, you, you know, it's gone in a second. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously we like, we probably don't like staring at spider webs and we want to take them away from the corner of our room. but. Um, but they're so perfect, they're so beautiful, if you think about it. Um, and I feel like if we saw them in cartoons or like, you know, a whole story about a spider and a spider web, then, then we would see the beauty of them. Whereas Absolutely. normally we just see them as, you know, a spider web, which we don't want. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But actually, I, I just, I don't know if it's the beauty of the fragility part, but I only can think of like memories from my childhood, but again, I think of that, not sure it's a flower, but it's definitely like uh, you find that like outside and mm -hmm. it's like round and you blow it and by blowing it, it just, what, what is, how is that called? I think it's like a dandelion, maybe. Dandelion, yeah, that could be the, yeah, exactly. And that's just like the bubbles. So as a child, I, I, I just wanted to find them because I wanted to break them. Right. But in the end, like just now I realize how beautiful and perfect they were in their like shape in the end. Mm -hmm. Like all these little sticks that just that's so fascinating to me. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I love looking at Katharina drawing. <laughs> I'm like mesmerized by them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I guess beauty is really, after all, it's subjective and we really just have each of us a different vision of beauty and it's never fixed in a certain standard, right? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly the conclusion for what, what we came up with today. Like, uh, mm -hmm. what's beautiful? I mean, there are, of course, certain things that are beautiful for could at least we could say are beautiful for everyone right. um, but at the same time uh, beauty is so subjective and also beauty standards if you think are mm -hmm. so subjective and and also change that fast like I think I can think of fashion or the way people get dressed or like cut their hair they really follow trends that are so unstable in a way, but still everyone follows them. Whether, I mean, that's, that's interesting to think of. Yeah, that is true because they change so quickly. I mean, one day this is fashionable and the other, this other thing is fashionable and the one that was fashionable yesterday is not any more cool, you know? Um, and I feel like everybody or most people, especially young, um, maybe adolescents who are growing, tend to look at fashion and tend to, um, you know, dress themselves based on what society thinks is trendy at the moment. But at the same time, growing, everybody wants to have their own personality and be their own version of themselves, um, you know, and try to wear what makes them feel comfortable and not what society believes is cool. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit, um, yeah, it's, it's weird because it's really subjective, but at the same time, you tend to follow what, what goes on. Um, yeah, but I, I'm wondering, is that beauty? Like what is fashionable? Sometimes it, I mean, that's my opinion, but it's so like unwearable and like, so, uh, weird that mm -hmm. I personally don't see it as beautiful. And even as a child, when I was probably more influential um mm -hmm. i used to buy stuff that my friends had that i thought was cool just because they had that mm -hmm. but if i think back i mean maybe i knew that that wasn't beautiful to me so like beauty is a thing and it's super 
like inside you is super intimate in a way like you because beauty is really about emotions it's really about getting a feeling on on, on things on on situations and while what is beautiful for society sometimes it's just i mean it's just there and the next day will be gone Not, yeah it's very fragile itself the the concept of beauty like it changes over time and it's never you know fixed um so the concept of, of beauty itself i think we could it can be defined as fragile um so this is kind of like a, a game like a word game because i mean we just said that fragility and beauty of fragility and now it's yeah it's yeah but it's crazy because it, it works every way around the way you put it you know you just flip the words and it works the same way yeah um, that's in the end because fragility i mean you can relate fragility to anything you can relate fragility mm -hmm. to your inner self to your outer self to society to the world to buildings even the most solid thing in the world is fragile or as uh, we say help me marta in italian we say punto debole oh yeah your, we like, uh, your weakness yeah exactly mm -hmm. so like the little thing you're perfect you're a perfect machine you're a perfect building a construction but you will always have like the little fragility that's a good metaphor because anything from humans to people to to things have this fragility yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys can relate to this or it's just, I mean, the fashion thing I was thinking of, because of course, Italy is also known as like a, a really, uh, a country that really relies on, on the fashion industry. For that, it's even exaggerated sometimes, or even with models, sometimes you, they've been trying to say that imperfections are welcomed in the fashion world, but what kind of imperfections? Like, can I say perfect imperfections? You know what I mean? So, yeah, exactly. Because they try to accept everyone and everything, everyone, everything that everybody has, like the mini imperfection. Um, but then, by by putting it, you know, by showing it, they also make it imperfect. I feel like it has to be a perfect imperfection. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, it's hard to describe, but uh, yeah, at the end of it, they try to accept all bodies, all, you know, all fashion trends, but there's always a sort of perfection they tend to go to um, in their trying to accept imperfection. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's something to think about. I think it's. Yeah. I don't know if from Malaysia you can say anything um, related to. Like related to this fragility of beauty in society, because that's that's the thing in the end. Like society uh, con continuously relates to the concept of beauty, but in a very it changes so fast. Yeah, I mean, like um, in Malaysia itself, uh, you can totally see like the beauty that you know, that comes, especially in like. Or what I would say in the culture and the traditional way of the Malaysians and the ancestry that goes behind it, you know that there are certain beauty that comes with it. You know, um, in Malaysia that we, as you or might you all, you might know or you might not know that we have we consist of twelve states. So that uh, you know each of these states have its own beauty standards uh, that they mm -hmm. have this beauty that they brought from their ancestral. Um, ancestral part in and that it shows towards their people and how they wear stuff and how they wear their they wear their clothes they wear their accessories and that really shows i mean like the beauty is definitely something that is different that it's very subjective as what um you might say uh, earlier and the fact that beauty is actually something that is not standard you know that even though it's beautiful yeah it's it's beautiful but it's beautiful for a certain person and it's very subjective and that if it's not beautiful do we consider it is it is as a beautiful you know the imperfections you know is it beautiful so if we see beautiful in imperfection but is is it really beautiful you know that standard we do not really want to put the standard on imperfection is actually still beautiful 
but in fact everything is beautiful you know that there are no certain ways to say <laughs> perfection is beautiful or beautiful is beautiful but yeah it's really fascinating to see the fact that um beauty and fragility fragility you know that beauty is definitely very fragile in society in malaysia um that beauty is definitely something that is been influenced by the media and by the ancestral history of it you know that it changes towards times um let, let me take an example you know as an estate in malaysia Sabah, Sarawak, that it's very tribal part a very tribal um, base um, history of a state um, so they were a certain um, uh, you know coming from tribal they have a very uh, forestry types of um, shield that they wear you know that they they hunt for their food so from hunting for their food you can see that they are uh, they are beauty beauty come, comes from how they wear their stuff and you know that they have their own they create their own shield as their own beauty of art you know that they wear um, certain clothes uh, that could probably imitate the forest just to ensure that they wouldn't be seen by the prey or by the animals i think um mm -hmm. what i would say what, what i would like to say is just to show the fact that um um the they use their they use the art they use the beauty by imitating um forests by imitating um, things that they see so you know as what I say earlier is that um beauty and art is actually very fragile as you know that it's not only based on what people think that is very beautiful but you know what you see is something that that is also art <laughs> if you might understand but yeah this is just what I think of it um yeah so basically that is it yeah hmm. firstly what do you think i mean like um coming from the same <laughs> country as mine malaysia i mean like well how do you find well it's hard to say because i i haven't like traveled for quite some time i travel but usually for work uh because right now i'm furthering degree before this i work as a contractor more on the fixing pipes, you know, water supply pipes. So I live in Kuala Lumpur, but sometimes uh, in certain months I drove, you know, hundreds of kilometers north or to the um, East Coast states. So, um, I mean, fragility and beauty, I never thought there's a connection before. But if I would like share, um, some idea of, it's not exactly some idea, um, my current experience of fragility and beauty, you would say. Okay, right now I have a car, uh, a Kia, just a normal Kia. Now, usually, or before this, that Kia is spot on. You know, like uh, I had it washed once a week or uh, once every two weeks, you know, it's always clean and so on. But right before I continue degree, you know, I was having a tough time. So it's really, you know, long story, but uh, I was having a tough time and I somehow let the car endure the weather. You know, I, um, what I mean by that, the car hasn't really had a chance to be washed. Sometimes for months, sometimes for six months, some uh, like for example, uh, before this i would say up to eight months i never wash my car that's first so you you know you can see the stains and all that secondly uh, around the campus i usually park the car under the tree you know very tall tree you know obviously people will park under the shade but in malaysia when you park under the shade it means bird droppings and tree i don't know tree sap or something so when it it stuck to the car, usually it's stuck forever. So I let that happen, you know, because I'm I was down uh, throughout two years ago or whatever. So in a sense, that fragility, I let it happen to my car. You usually don't hear boys do this, right? 
usually boys and cars always squeaky clean, always shiny, you know, try to impress some girls. But as far as expression goes, in this case, I let my car kind of like endure the weather in the same way I endure this episode of life, you know, try to endure the dark times, trying to be better, trying to work things out. So, yeah, I guess that's my closest example of fragility and beauty because fragility sometimes is just showing how hard we try to be good, how hard we try to be better. Yeah, I guess that's my take on it. Yeah, I think that's re that's a really good example. I love the parallelism you made between <laughs> like your inside, you know, your state mentally, physically, whatever it was, and your car, which like your own thing reflected onto an object, you know, uh, that yeah. yeah. I mean, the car is still in bad conditions. The sap, I could not remove the stains. <laughs> so, but so, even so, um, there is a tendency to feel guilty. You know, you should. You know you should take care of your car and whatnot but at the same time when you when i see my car you know this evening um uh, like okay it is not in totally good shape but i understand that in the sense when you i look at my car it's a bit like i'm looking into the mirror yeah this is the this is my state right now so it's okay you know maybe in a few months maybe in a year maybe we get into a better place and maybe i can have it wash or we paint it who knows i i love this this image you just said of like looking at like some product or result of your past behavior in life and see that as a mirror that's super interesting and that's super relatable right that happens to everyone like, can yeah. I take this occasion to, to read a question from the public, um, and which is very interesting. They say, um, what is the best way to integrate beauty in our daily life? And, and Chris is asking both for Italy and for Malaysia. What, what could that be? What is the best way to integrate beauty in our daily life? Well, in Malaysia, um, you know, like if you live in the, like we are Malaysian, I'm Malaysian. So sometimes we have a, you know, that quiet noise of, you know, other countries are better than us. We should learn from them. But sometimes it is surprising to me that when people actually say good things about us, because, you know, it's a bit like our own personal internal monologue. Oh, you, People think good about us, so sometimes unbelievable. But one thing about um, to embody beauty in life, especially in Malaysia, one thing that I heard people say is our manners. For for a Muslim country, you know, like sometimes you hear Muslim countries in chaos. I know it's speaking bad, but sometimes it's true. So when people look at us, you know, a Muslim country, a Southeast Asian country, uh, and a developing modern country, so they are quite surprised that our manners are still good. Uh, yeah, I guess that's one thing about uh, us Malaysians. Yeah, we're having a tough time with you know, politics and economics and whatnot. But in our everyday life, our manners, our the way we talk to people is always uh, the indication, indicator of our um, appreciation of beauty. Because in Malaysia, we don't really, you know, talk about art the same way as European. You know, this, the statues and the abstract ideas. Usually in Malaysia, the perception of beauty is is a bit like just um, decoration. It's very rare that people understand beauty in the same way as um, European or Japanese. So that's still, you know, we're still learning about that to appreciate that. Yeah, but 
all in all, in Malaysia, one of the things that we that people kind of like salute is for a modern to modernize. We don't really have to discard manners, so we kind of like bring modern and manners along. Yeah, I guess that's what makes us appreciate beauty in that way. I think that's very interesting for us, Marta, right? Because that's super true. Like, um, like to generalize, like Europe and Asia, uh, especially some countries, just just Malaysia, as you said, uh, like decorate in different things, in different ways. So you you decorate a lot, uh, like temples and and uh, colors. I I feel here we have more like mar marble, uh, white and this kind of beauty, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and to say my view on, on, on the beauty of, I think we got we got one one over each other. Go ahead. No, I was just saying it's interesting to see how different different countries perceive it. Something that could be the same but it's so different, not only subjectively but also like, you know, internationally from country to country. Um, and I love seeing different, you know, Malaysian ways of seeing and you know, thinking. So let's let's just close with the last question because they just got now. So let's let's just use a couple. They asked, uh, can beauty be taught? So drawing from this example we said, so uh, you have a perception of beauty as a country and we have another one but can you teach what is beauty to people what would you think of it yeah i mean like um yeah definitely i think beauty can definitely be thought um you know especially coming from a malaysia where you know beauty is more towards following standards i think that's very hard but i think all in all, you know, exhibition like this is something that thought and make us realize even more that beauty is something that, you know, people should appreciate even more that it comprises of subjective opinions, that beauty isn't just following standards, beauty isn't just um, thinking that, um, you know, someone agrees on that beauty, that it's considered as beauty. Well, in fact, everything is beautiful that who you are itself is just beautiful um yeah beauty is more about in malaysia i mean like what i can say beauty is definitely something that we thought but it's more towards making us realize that everything is beautiful that we haven't really put the standards we haven't really put the realization on us that um it's actually not about following standards but it's actually more towards understanding and you know more of self-appreciating more towards um, looking at positivity, uh, more towards looking at the bright side of it, that everything has its own story, everything that has its own uniqueness, and that, um, yeah, I myself, <laughs> I myself, I consider myself as a very beautiful man, you know, um, uh, despite knowing the fact that I may or may not, or I am following the standards of beauty, beauty standards, but yeah, it's very unique and it's very best fascinating um, knowing that everyone's different and that beauty is something that should be acceptable to others and should be appreciated even more despite our differences. Mm -mm. Interesting, very interesting. Yeah. My my view is more on the subjective part of beauty. So like you can't really teach what it's beautiful and what it's not because beauty is too subjective to follow like this like on off uh like mechanism but for sure i think we all should teach people to see beauty everywhere in a way so like to accept beauty as a thing of the world that applies to anything so there are there isn't any such thing like a beautiful thing and a and, and a non-beautiful thing like everything is beautiful in its own way i think that's that should be the key message like to be taught yeah i think we can conclude on this note that everything can be beautiful in its own way and as you said Benetta, like it can be taught i mean 
at school we've experienced teachers or other students tell us oh this is beautiful but maybe according to them it is according to us something else is more beautiful um, it's really subjective at the end of it but we need to learn um, especially in these times to see beauty, beauty pretty much everywhere around us because it's really around us and we just fail sometimes to see it and to capture it yeah right absolutely True. So I, I'd like to thank you all very much. Um, it, it was a very interesting conversation, a very interesting exchange of, of cultures and countries. So thank you guys for being here, really. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, we thank again uh, artist Maria Rafikavali for taking some time to, to chat with us at the beginning. And, and uh, lastly, but not least, <laughs> I, I would like to thank Katerina which offered us this amazing um, draw. And we hope to be able to share this with, with you uh, uh, soon on our website. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you, everyone. And Thank we you. invite you to visit the exhibition, Fragilita, which is, uh, you can find the link uh, basically anywhere. So just go and visit it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone.